everyone for joining me today. I'm basically going to be taking you over sort of a year by year guide of what is needed um, to get into the university that you're aiming at in the US. And the way we're going to structure this is I'm first going to talk to you a little bit about um, why you might want to study in the US, then sort of give you a holistic overview of the application, what all it consists of. And then I'm going to take you over every year of high school, ninth to 12th, and what you should be doing um, in that year to work towards your application. Now, the way I've broken it down is a progressive module. So say you're already in 11th, you can obviously assume that you should have already been doing what is in the ninth and 10th year. And if not, be feel more than free to incorporate those elements into your application prep. And if you're in ninth, then it's good to have a roadmap ahead of what you want to be doing for the next four years. So if you have any questions as we go on, please feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A section uh, throughout, because I know we tend to forget our questions if we wait till the very end. So feel free to keep doing that. That's perfectly fine. Uh, I may only take them at the end, but it would be great to hear from you throughout. And we'll have a dedicated Q&A section at the end. Hopefully that works for everyone. Uh, if you've understood a point, it's always great if you leave me a thumbs up or the heart reaction, whatever. Okay, let's get started. So, um, don't have to worry about that. Okay, so now you might want to first start off by thinking about whether studying abroad is right for you or not. Aside from just the fact that I think it's a very glamorous option for some of us, some of our siblings have already studied abroad. There's several factors that kind of lead to uh, almost like a pressure, I would say that you need to go abroad and study, but of course it is not the right fit for absolutely everyone. I myself did my schooling at Ashoka University and then went to UPenn for one semester. So I don't think that there's any sort of lack of benefit from staying in the country, but you might want to, of course, explore the US as a very, very good uh, alternative to your education here. So some of the best reasons to go abroad, I'd say is really the resources because the US education system is pretty much in the forefront as far as resources are considered definitely in terms of labs and just kind of, you know, overall state-of-the-art facilities, they do have everything, even some of the smaller, more private universities. Um, the faculty tends to be all at the forefront of development research in that field, so it's great to learn from them in person. And you also do have a much better major selection abroad. So um, aside from just kind of like psychology, biology, economics, history, you're going to have much more niche um, areas of interest. Uh, something that's become very, very popular is studying business along with tech. So um, business information technology, for instance, is a bit of a booming major at the moment in the US with more and more universities offering some sort of intersection of those subjects. So it really does help, I think, having a more specific viewpoint uh, from a bachelor's uh, degree level already. Of course, there's no harm in waiting till a master's level, but that does work better for some people, especially if you're looking at a more creative or interdisciplinary major. Uh, further, the U.S. sort of has a much more holistic application process, as I'll just break down for you in a few minutes. And you're going to see that even if you don't have the best grades, you do have a chance at a good university, which often doesn't end up happening um, here in India because it is very, very grade centric here, except for a few of the liberal arts universities, as I'm sure you're all aware. So that way um, it can definitely work well. OK. Um, do we need 12th grade midterms for US? Uh, yeah, I'll get to all of that in just a moment. So you'll see. This is kind of just to help you decide the right country to apply to um, some things that you want to keep in mind, because you do want to remember that there is a very marked distinction between, I would say, the US, the UK, Canada, Singapore, India, Hong Kong, Australia. I had broken down all of these differences uh, in a webinar a few, I think a month or so ago. Um, but here's just a quick recap, uh, which is to kind of look at the courses and the careers that interest you. Also where you want to practice the career that you're aiming to get. For instance, for law, they always say, please study law where you aim to practice law. So if you're aiming to come home and study law, you probably would just want to stay in the country and study it. As opposed to if you want to go to the UK and study law, you would want to like learn it there in the first place if you want to practice. Um, and then there's always other factors such as does the education system 
fit me, for instance, in Canada, the education system is extremely academically driven and very, very rigorous, whereas in the UK, it is more holistic and does give you time for more of a creative enterprise on the side and just more holistic development, I would say, uh, than their personal factors, such as where does your family reside? A lot of people have family in the US, have family in the UK, so little things like that. And overall, just kind of take, I would say, more than just brand names into account when choosing the correct country for yourself. Uh, now, every US school tends to have three, sorry, university tends to have three schools within it. The first is the School of Arts and Sciences, which would be your School of Liberal Arts. Now, liberal arts is sort of, I would say, a buzzword at the moment because it's definitely booming both in India and, of course, it's been the norm in the United States for several years now. Um, basically, it just refers to sort of, isn't the arts here is a bit of a misnomer because the sciences do come under liberal arts as well. So it's any of your, um, you know, classic majors and the beauty of the liberal arts system is that it gives you a lot of freedom so if you are struggling because and once you graduate high school you're going to be 17 18 years old so that's very very young uh, to know exactly what you wanted to do in college so the liberal arts system gives you that flexibility you get to play around with your major maybe you're interested in psychology but you're also interested in um physics so you get to kind of mess around with both the subjects still about halfway into your second year when you have to lock in your choice and it does allow you to do a minor on the side and a concentration so it's very flexible very good for people who don't have a singular interest so that's something to definitely keep in mind uh the next is the school of business so that's pretty straightforward it's just a study business in all its forms as i mentioned even within business we're having quite a boom of new majors new niches coming up so that's super interesting uh still some flexibility there some schools sort of allow you to get into the liberal arts school and then if you're interested uh, you can shift over to the School of Business if you choose that that's the way that you want to go uh, or vice versa. If you started off as business and you're like, you know what, this is not for me, I'd rather do pure economics, you can make that switch. Uh, and then lastly is usually the School of Engineering, um, the School of like Art, like pure art and design, that's separate, so I'm not touching upon that. Uh, but yeah, engineering, that's again, pretty straightforward. So you would have the least flexibility here, I would say. So you would have to kind of, because there's just a lot of work to get done in those four years, like you're studying engineering. So you would have to commit right in the beginning, but it does give you the flexibility in terms of your niche of engineering. So you can switch between say computer engineering or mechanical engineering, that flexibility is there, something that is not given to you in other countries. For instance, the UK, so you choose computer engineering and then you decide you wanna switch over to mechanical, you would have to essentially drop out of college and reapply. So that flexibility is there. So this is the main structure of education in the US. Now, here's a breakdown of the application process. Now, there are three main things that make up your US application. And I really want you to think of this as a pie that's made up of 50% your academics. Now, your academics really refers to anything from your ninth grade to your 12th grade, right? That counts. Um, ninth grade, obviously, a lot of people come to me and they say, um, I didn't get the best marks in my ninth. Do I still have a shot at the US? Of course you do. Nobody expects you to be scoring brilliantly right out bad but they do want to see that you are consistently getting better so is your 10th grade better than your 9th is your 11th grade better than your 10th for instance that trajectory now here are the two grades that will play the most important role are your 10th finals and your 11th finals now a lot of people think that your 11th grade marks don't actually matter but they do for two very obvious reasons i would say one is that 11th grade is the first time when you get to pick your own subjects so the university wants to see when you're given that freedom and you're allowed to think for yourself, are you performing well, right? Or are you still struggling? Are you not being able to fit in? Are you considering it a part of you and sort of allowing yourself to take that time off? So that is makes it fairly important. And secondly, because your predicted grades, the most important thing that you're going to be applying with come from a mixture of your 11th grade finals and your 12th midterms. Now, somebody asked a question about the 12th midterms. So that's kind of where they play a role in helping create your predicted grade. A lot of schools will sort of bulk that up in any case to give you a better predicted grade, but it's not something to bank on at all. So you want to do as well as possible 10th onwards, just every single set of exams you have. Um, then in this pie, the next 30% becomes your um, extracurriculars. Now, when we talk about extracurriculars in the US, we're mainly talking about three different types. So the first would be your co-curriculars or your academic pursuits. So this is any form 
of an academic activity that you're taking beyond the classroom. So say you're really interested in history, how are you exploring history outside of that same curriculum that everybody gets in the classroom, right? So maybe I had a student who got early decision with 50% scholarship to Tufts University, a very good school uh, for history. And something that she had done was go around, she, she lived in Amritsar, and document all the local lesser known monuments because she felt like they didn't have enough representation within the country's archives. And then she also sort of spoke to a lot of survivors of partition who lived around where she lived and documented their experiences because despite it being such a relevant incident in our history, it's very under documented. So things like this, which are actually, they're not, they're not going to have global impact because of the scale at which they're happening, but there's such important pieces of work that to push through with something like that really does affect your application. So when we're talking about academic interests, that can be anything from online courses or research papers or um, you know internships that directly relate to your major. But you basically want to build up that interest in your major outside the classroom too, so that people know that you are willing to take initiative and you're willing to push the boundaries yourself without the classroom having to dictate everything for you. Um, the next kind of extracurricular is your passion-based one. So this is where uh, your dancing or your fifth level Trinity guitar playing is gonna really speak for you because the US is very, very interested in having uh, consistency in their candidates. They wanna see that you can commit to one thing so really, the way I talk about it is you want to show that you're a ma you know a jack of all trades, but that you are also a master of some of them. So say you have been playing football, you want to show that you have dedicatedly been playing football for five to six years or even three to four years. But you want to show that you are not constantly waking up and changing your mind every single day because they don't like that. They don't like that kind of finicky um, hummingbird personality. You do need to lock down on a few things and be very dedicated with them. And this honestly... If there's no such thing as a good activity or a bad one, uh, you know, a lot of people put chess as something that they've been playing for a long time. And obviously, if you have merits in this, if you played competitions, it does help a lot. But even if you haven't, but you've just been consistent with something that does go a long way and that does speak very highly of your profile. Um, the third and the last kind of extracurricular that you want to look at here would be your social work. Uh, and I'm not talking about kind of just running around to get volunteer certificates in your last year. Everybody knows those are likely fake and they don't hold the same, you know, actual importance and impact as social work that comes directly from the student. So you want to think about something that really, I would say, is a problem in your local community. It doesn't have to be something really big. It can be something pretty simple, like uh, maybe there's a broken road and nobody's looked after it for really, really long. Are you maybe looking at that? Are you raising funds for it? Are you maybe making, once you've finished fixing that, are you looking at other community problems? Are you creating a little bit of a buzz around, you know, this funding venture, anything. So really here, I think, is a great place to sort of brainstorm with a mentor or a career guide of some kind, because it's very important to have a good personal project if you have that kind of time on your hands. Um, the last part of this pie is your standardized testing. Uh, your standardized testing would be your SAT or your ACT. A lot of people have the confusion that the SAT is much more broadly accepted. That's absolutely not true. The SAT and the ACT are absolutely equivalent. Their only aim is to sort of help give you a standardized score and distinguish you from students who might have a similar profile otherwise. Um, so that is sort of the third part. A lot of people choose not to submit their scores, but that does kind of then get subsumed into your academics, the percentage that's set aside for standardized testing. Also in your academics, it's important to remember that something called class rank is very big in the US. So that is where you sit within your school, right? Now, a lot of our schools don't actually give class rank, but in case they do, you wanna find out where you sit and you wanna find out how you get, get ahead in that. Uh, I see a few questions, I'll just take those now. Um, okay, these are pretty big questions. So I'll get to them in the end. This is just kind of like a quick fact sheet on why you might want to study in the US. Um, First being that it is the most flexible and student-centric system at the moment in the sense that they do give a lot of importance and independence to students' individual decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
it is a four-year program as opposed to a three-year program which is offers a more in-depth education on whatever your subject choice is it is also the most expensive education system in the world at the moment um for several years now i believe in the last two three years itself there has been a massive hike in fees so if you are considering going to the us you do want to do that with the knowledge that you would be putting aside maybe three crore for the endeavor right um so it is in no way a light decision or anything. Of course, aid and scholarship are always there, but you do want to uh, make sure that you are not going in with the surety that these things will be there for you because unless you have great grades and great extracurriculars, it can get a little tricky, right? Uh, then of course it does, like I mentioned, there is a very good range of niche majors and minors. Uh, so it is pretty enticing in that way, I would say. And finally, uh, good placements and good job prospects, because um, a lot of these universities carry very, very good tabs because they are some of the best schools in the world. So, yeah. OK, now let's move on to the road mapping. So this is where I would like you all to kind of, you know, maybe if you have a sheet of paper or anything, figure out where you are in this timeline from 9th to 12th, see what you've already done from these things or see what you might want to start working on. And as I mentioned, even if you're in 11th or 12th, things that I am listing under 9th would still be accurate to you. They're just things that I believe are best to start in these years, OK? Uh, so the first thing that I would say is really important in the ninth grade is to establish a passion activity. I see a lot of people struggling with this when they're in the, like 11th or 12th because they say, I don't have one thing that I've invested a lot of time in. You know, I'm really good at art, but I never actually set aside the time to pursue it. You don't have to pursue it in any way that is inconvenient to you or that is taking away time from you. It can be as simple as, um, you know, put, making art every once a week. Then you'd have an entire, imagine if you start in ninth grade. By 12th, you'll have a portfolio that shows your entire growth from over four years of practicing art and experimenting with new mediums and maybe different styles or doing a few courses. So having a passion activity looks super good for your character and honestly just helps your personality bloom in any case. So really you want to think about something you, and it has to be something you enjoy doing, right? Like I mentioned, there's nothing like a good passion activity and a bad passion activity. Though of course, something like video gaming uh, tends to hold a little bit less weightage, but even then there are ways to really spin that into a good story or do good work in that field regardless. So you want to establish a passion activity that you're going to carry forward for at least the next three to four years. Um, you want to start investing time in social work. Now, a lot of people think ninth grade is too young, but I'm not saying you have to come up with your own objective, like business in ninth grade that's going to save the world. I'm just saying start taking an interest in social work, right? Maybe start teaching some children at a local school, maybe start making some donation drives, maybe put up a local community performance and send the funding to somebody who needs it. It's pretty simple that way. Just take an active interest in your community. I would say that's a very, very good first step to be taking at this point. Uh, next would be to start working on your writing skills. I think as each year is going by, we really are seeing students kind of writing less and less, you know, just from the time that I was in high school, just a couple of years, like seven years ago, there has been a very, very big difference in the demands of writing on the student. And I think that that's leading to a huge degradation in the writing quality that students have. Um, and there is nothing more important because by the time you have to give your SATs or uh, write your essays for your university or even just know how to speak well in an interview, your writing skills are going to really, you know, play a big part for all of this. So I would say even if it's just asking your parents to give you like a prompt once a week and trying to write it out and then trying to see how you do and see if you're, you know, maybe correcting any of your mistakes or if you can get feedback from someone. Something that we do as a company a lot is work with you on your writing skills and kind of help you see which direction you should be taking them in. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something I would encourage you to start in ninth grade itself. Uh, and the last is to start exploring career paths already. Start understanding what kind of a person you are, what your aptitude is, where your inclination lies, right? Um, when I was in ninth grade, I wanted to be a marine biologist and I'm awful at biology and I'm scared of the sea. So had I actually sat down and thought about these two factors, I wouldn't have wasted a lot of my time preparing for a career that I would have less than a zero percent like success rate in. So it's to kind of try to actually start matching your aptitude to where you want to head in life. So I would say it's a really good time to start thinking about it. 
And also the opposite way, because a lot of us just assume that we can't do certain careers. Like we're like, oh, I'm interested in medicine, but I could never be a doctor. Why not? Right? You don't know until you try. Start actively taking an interest, start reading up about things, maybe take an online course, maybe talk to a family friend that's a doctor, start finding out, right? So you never know until you actually try something out, whether it is a good fit for you or not. Um, and definitely, I mean, the mindless assessment, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, it is an excellent tool to actually help match you to your aptitude and actually breaks down all the different ways in which your brain works and how your skill set is uh, and gives you your top career matches. And I think that it's a really great assessment to take every single year, ninth onwards. Um, I believe there's a modified version for ninth and 10th and then the full version for 11th and 12th. So really uh, would encourage you to look into that. Uh, 10th grade, um, board year, very big year. One of the best things I would say that you should start doing in 10th is start networking actively. Um, LinkedIn is really the place where all meaningful social interaction is taking place in 2023, I think. Uh, and a lot of the times we're just too shy to start one. We don't want to be putting out what we're doing. Um, I have students who go for excellent programs. I just had a student come back from Wharton Summer School and she didn't want to post about it online. And then when she posted about it on LinkedIn, she actually got a reply from the university directly. So that kind of thing really helps document what you've been doing and also gives you feedback and encouragement and connections. So start networking in 10th, draw your LinkedIn, start getting to know people, start kind of organizing your connections to see which kind of people and what kind of universities you would actually want to associate yourself with when you're older. Right? Uh, then the next thing is definitely your grades. Nothing is more important in 10th than your actual board exams, right? Uh, I'm sure you all are from different boards. Could you just let me know in the chat, not in the Q&A, but which boards you're from? I'm guessing there must be some ICSC, anybody in IB, anybody taking their A-level, I mean, not you can't be taking, anybody taking IGCSC, whatever your current boards are, IGCSC, ICSC, right? So you really do want to get, um, right. So we have everybody, I think, from different boards here. That's great. Guys, nothing is more important than this. I know like people say, oh, you know, uh, in school, they tell us our board grades are super important. And then we get to college, and nobody cares about them. But you only get to college because you got your board marks in the first place. Let's be really, really clear about that. So it's really hard to recover when you haven't scored too well. Of course, again, as I mentioned, as long as it's getting better, that's OK. So say you scored a 60 percent in ninth and an 80 percent in tenth, that's OK right? Or as, even a 70%, as long as you're getting better. That means in, 11, in 11th, you will have to score that 85% and then in the 12th, finally bring home a 90 to 95%, right? That is sort of the ideal trajectory. Of course, there are different ways in which everything happens and there are exceptions to everything. But if you're talking about playing it safe, that is kind of your orientation. Uh, this is a great place to start, you to start building your co-curriculars and your extracurriculars. Everybody understands the difference between co-curriculars and extracurriculars, right? Give me a thumbs up if, if it's clear. Is it not clear? Okay, I'll just go over it super, super fast. Your co-curriculars are basically anything that are augmenting your major choice, right? Making it um, already kind of complementing what you're doing. Your extracurriculars are things that are completely outside that. So to hark back to our breakdown of activities, co-curriculars would be your academic ones and your extracurriculars would be the other ones, right? Uh, and this is also why I said it's really important to identify the kind of country that you're interested in, because if you're interested in the UK, then only your co-curriculars matter. Right, you could have won the fields medal in math, but if you're applying for history, they're not going to care. So um, there, you need to be really focused on just your major. In the U.S., you have to ultimately fill out an activity list of ten activities, so it's really good to have very good variety in there. Okay, um, and the last thing that I would want you to really focus on in tenth grade is your subject selection. I cannot tell you how many students I have had just drop math in 10th without thinking, uh, in 11th without thinking about it, and then later want to study business or want to study engineering. And I'm like, I don't know what to do for you beyond the point, right? Because you've gone ahead and you've dropped math because you didn't enjoy math, which is 
you know, understandable, but you're also then greatly affecting your future because it is something that plays such a vital role in so many majors. For instance, psychology has such a big math con like component. So it's very important to always remember that you can't take this decision lightly. I would say talk to a professional about it, talk to your parents about it, talk to your teachers about it. And of course, choose subjects that are not going to hold you back. So if you're absolutely ghastly, say at math, then don't push ahead with it. But make sure that you do truly put some decision, like some thought into this decision. Okay, great, moving on. 11th grade. So now here's where you want to, regardless of which country you're applying to, do start doing pointed academic co-curriculars, most importantly internships. I would say internships do hold a certain regard on your profile. So working, you can start with just working at your parents company or a relative's company. Uh, anything that actually relates to your major would be super, super good. Um, start talking to family, friends, people, reach out on LinkedIn, right? You can send pretty emails, you might get one response, but that one response might just be an opportunity you're looking for. So that is definitely something that you wanna be doing in your 11th. Um, then is keeping up your grades. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of people take 11th to be a party year. It absolutely isn't if you want to study in the US. It is the most important. So please keep your focus in 11th. Do not let your grades slip. Uh, for instance, I currently have a student who got uh, a 1570 in his SAD, which is fantastic, and has an 85% in his 10th, but he has a 50% in 11th, which makes our application choices very limited compared to what they would have been otherwise. Um, Moving on, uh, yeah, you might you want to start the college selection process already. Now, if you have been attending my webinars, you might remember me talking about how we say that we want the college to be a good match for us. But what the college is doing is it's looking to see if you're a good match for it at the same time, right? So um, because it has a certain kind of student that it wants as well. Now, this is not something that all of us need to do, but if you have kind of your eyes set on one university or one type of university, you do want to start working on being the kind of student that they pick up. So this is especially relevant, obviously, when you're talking about Ivy Leagues or anything of that kind, because you want to make sure that you are making their requirements, right? Then there's some universities that are very big on sports. Are you including some sort of sports in your entire profile? So think about factors like that. And uh, finally, and this one I think is really like an actual, like just a tip um, that can really, really boost your application is to try and form really meaningful connections with your mentors. Now, this ranges from your, like your principal at your school to your subject teachers, to the people you do internships with. Don't just, you know, have an attitude because you can try to have a really positive, friendly, um, helpful demeanor that they're going to remember because they might be the people writing your LORs and that LOR might make or break your application, right? So start forming those connections now in 11th or before, but like 11th pay special attention to it. Okay, 12th grade, start, obviously, this is where you not start, you have to narrow down your college selection, including your ED, ED referring to your early decision school, which last last time I asked, all of you did have a good understanding of. Uh, but just to recap really, really quickly, an ED school is sort of the school that you make a pact with. So it's a tripartite pact between yourself, the university you're applying to and your school, wherein if you get in and they can meet your financial requirements, you have to go there, right? So it's not something to be taken lightly or to be broken, but it is a strategically really important decision. And there is a certain science and math behind making your ED decision. So I would say again, here, talk to a professional to make sure that you're doing it correctly um, and also start narrowing down your schools. Trust me, a lot of people are like, I can send out 50 applications, why don't I? Because you're gonna, stretch yourself very, very thin. You're going to be writing 90 essays for no reason. Choose 10 to 12 good universities that you are happy with and apply to those with a good mix of dream, target, and safety schools, right? The next thing you want to do is take all of the activities that you've been doing till then and push them to the next level. So if you are, say, uh, you know, this is the point at which if you're doing internships or research, this is where you want to combine all that you've been learning and write a really good research paper or start a venture of your own, right? So it's something that kind of encapsulates all the hard work that you've been putting in over the last several years. Uh, the next point I would have is to show demonstrated interest. Demonstrated interest is basically when you let a university know way before application season opens that I'm interested in your university 
and I want to go here. Now, the reason this happens is because universities usually have one rep for a country, more or less, or somebody on the admissions team who in those final rounds of decision making might recognize your name. So um, for instance, Skidmore is very big on demonstrated interest. So if you write to them at the beginning of your 12th year, asking them some questions, even if you know the answers, just to start a conversation, saying that you're interested in their university, it does help them remember who you are and it does show them that, hey, this person is willing to go the extra step for my school, like my school, right? Um, and the last thing that you, I would really recommend doing if you have the time and the energy and the skill set is to commit to a personal project, right? Something that you can call your own. This is super, super easy. I think if you're into like coding or computers, because you can just make a website for some initiative you care about. Often I tell my students to combine this with social work because you can create a website to solve some kind of local problem that might not otherwise have easy resource access or something like that. So whatever you're interested in, uh, and again, this has to be something that you're genuinely extremely interested in, uh, do commit to that and do start a personal project, right? Um, this is just kind of like uh, what we offered you along this road. Uh, that's my phone number and that's my email address. If you want to have a chat about your application, remember 9th is not too early to start. You do want to start thinking about the entire process already. Um, so I'm just going to leave that on the screen while I answer your questions. Um, it says, I would love to go to the US and getting get into MIT is my dream, but my worry is that when I come back to India, will the MIT tag have some weightage in granting me a good job, or is IIT the only option? Also, how long do you think someone would have to stay in the US to study and get their degree in MIT? Uh, okay, so firstly, MIT is going to be pretty much, uh, you know, like an access to anywhere that you want to go. It is, of course, regarded as possibly one of the top three schools for engineering at the moment and for anything tech related. So I wouldn't worry that India would ignore the MIT tag. I would say in many ways it is just as impressive as an IIT. Some uni some companies will prefer it if they are more on the Western corporate level. So I would not worry about that. Uh, for the length, it would really depend on your major, but don't. it'll be a minimum of four years. Try it. Class 11 marks is not told by the school to us. What will I fill there? Hmm, that's a big problem. I don't know. Like, I guess you'll have to request your transcript and maybe refer to the school to fill it out for you. I've, I've not really heard of you not getting any marks for your 11th, so do look into that. What if 11th grade marks is not so great as 10th, but then 12th grades are awesome? What are the chances of acceptance? They are good, right? Uh, but your 11th grade marks are going to play a part in that whole thing. So what you want to do there is you want to try to explain in there's a space called the additional information essay. Uh, you want to try to explain why you haven't performed that well there. And it should be a pretty uh, solid reason. It shouldn't be like, I just didn't take the year seriously. So maybe you can talk about something that happened in your personal life that did affect that decision. Um, but yeah, try to keep it up. Also, it depends on what you consider 11th grade marks not being too good to even me, right? Like an 80% is great, 75 also okay. Uh, it's only when it goes into the 60s and the 50s, I would say that it's truly problematic. Do the IVs accept international baccalaureate student? If yes, do they take our predicted points and accept us or give a conditioned offer and wait for us to get our actual results? So the IVs are very much IB biased, I would say, right? Like just the way uh, the UK is A-level biased because that's the Cambridge board. IB is the US oriented board. So it's definitely preferred by the Ivy League schools. For all boards, they will take your predicted and they will give you a final offer. This is not the UK, they don't give conditional offers. So they will either tell you you've gotten in or you haven't gotten in based on your predicted. But IB is a big plus because they take in course wriggle and they know that you're doing a harder course than ICSE or CBSE, right? Um, what types of social work is accepted at the application? Absolutely anything you're interested in doing. Um, it can be anything from an individual project to a community-based project to something that affects the whole country whatever works for you. Um, in social work, can I participate in supporting animal care centers? Of course, I have had many students write really good essays about how they've started initiatives for street dogs or how they've you know, uh, done like a beach cleanup for turtles and stuff like that. So all of that works. What do you mean by establishing connections in 10th? I mean, getting on LinkedIn and spending about half an hour there every day, talking to people in the kind of jobs you're interested in, talking to people at the kind of universities that you're interested in, right? Uh, does a gap year prove to be helpful or it stays neutral or does it create a bad impression? It really depends on how you use your gap year, right? Um, so if you have taken a gap year, you want to show that you have done a lot of things during that year and that you weren't just sitting at home. 
Um, so it needs to be something pretty impressive that you're doing in your gap year, or at least a variety of things so that you don't fall back. Any other questions here? I'm in 11th grade and just started my co-curriculars and extracurriculars, although my grades are good, so will I be able to get into good college? And the US is a lot more expensive than the UK. How much of a chance of scholarship would I be able to get? Uh, Rajesh, this is, I'd, I'd need to know more about your profile. Why don't you drop me an email and we can discuss this in a bit more detail so that we can properly plan out what you're doing, okay? So it's a little hard to answer off of such information. I'm currently in ICSE 10th. Do I need to switch to IV? You do not need to switch to IV. I get this question all the time. There is no prerequisite requirement to switch to IV. ICSE is just as valid. It is just as good. Everybody knows it's an excellent board. There's no such pressure. The only thing is that IB is considered to be more rigorous because it is harder and more in-depth. Um, but also, uh, it's just not a good personality connection for some people, right? Like a lot of people think that, oh, it'll prepare me for studying in the US, but it might also take away your chance studying in the US because you might not be able to adjust to the board in such little time, right? Like college is a full reset, but high school is not. So that can throw you off your game. If you want to and you like the subjects, go ahead. But there's no like necessity at all. My passion is trading in the stock market. How can I show that in my college application? They just dropped me an email. I have worked with many students who have a passion for the stock market and they have built fantastic projects around it. So let's discuss this in detail because it'll be hard to just talk off at like the top of my head. State boards can apply. Absolutely, yeah. They, so a lot of the universities will give you a chance to choose your board and it'll say other state boards for India. That's what you'll choose. And yeah, as I said, animal care centers completely relevant. Anything else? I got very good marks in ninth, but in tenth I dipped down due to overconfidence. My boards are yet to come. Have I messed up? As after I got good marks in ninth, but got bad once again in tenth. Oh, that would really depend on how bad it is. And again, if you can pull that up in eleventh and twelfth, I don't see any reason for it to not take a good turn, right? And this is something you can explain people. The U.S. loves an underdog story. So if you're like, I was doing this, then I got overconfident, then I messed up, and then I pulled myself together and I did really well, they're going to love that. So don't worry too much, but do focus on your grades. Um, I'm interested in being an entrepreneur. What major would you recommend to me? Or will she again drop me an email so we can talk about this in some detail? Is SAT exam really necessary? No, it's not. If you don't want to give your SAT, don't give your SAT. It's not a necessity. Um, just kind of, it is a boost to your application, right? But it is not something that you have to do. But of course, if you're aiming at a top, top school, uh, it's very hard to do that without an SAT. So again, think about that. Is IELTS exam recommended for US nationally students studying in, for US nationality students studying in India? Uh, if you are a US citizen, you do not have to give IELTS. You can, just to be very, very safe, because some schools may be like you're a citizen, but not a resident, but usually it's fine. Uh, let's just take the last few questions. Yes, class 11 is very, very necessary. Kashish, as I mentioned through my presentation, it does dictate your predicted grades and it shows it's a pretty big part of your application. So your 11th is very important. Would you recommend doing APs with A-levels? Absolutely. Your APs will look really, really good. Choose APs that um, you know really augment your application. For instance, if you're an equal student, I would recommend doing like microeconomics and statistics. Don't do microeconomics and macroeconomics, right? You don't want to congest it with information that's not relevant. Plus your APs are really hard to give. So if you are giving additional exams, do make sure that they help your application. Do I need to write PSAT? PSAT? No, you don't. Um, you can just give your SAT directly. That's fine. Um, can we have a similar session in detail for Canada? I will talk to the team about that. Uh, do the international exams like the SOF help in admission? Yeah, any kind of like Olympiad or competition works really, really well. Okay. Okay, guys, thanks so much for all the questions and for everything. If you need to talk to me still after this, that's my phone number. That's my email address. Um, I'm available anytime. So please do drop by. I really hope this was useful for you and you learned something. And uh, I answered some of your questions. So thank you so much. Have a lovely night.